Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. My name is Corey McKinney. Um, today I'm going to be learning about, I believe the way you pronounce this is Fluminense. Uh, as far as I know, it is part of the uh, Brazilian Football League, which probably has a name that I should have looked up before I started this video, but I did not. I'm trying to branch out from the English Premier League though. Uh, last week I brought Cameron on and he taught me about La Liga, uh, just a kind of just a very very th ten thousand foot view of La Liga and tried to, and got me in uh, integrated into that. I saw this video while I was looking for some content to shoot. Um, about Fluminense um, and how they have some of the weirdest tactics in the world and as you guys know I've been on this tactical journey through the game of football and so when I saw this I was like man this has got to be something that I watch this is the philosophy of Fernando Dinez and uh, this is brought to you by the purest football this is a new channel to me that I've subscribed to recently so if you guys don't know who this is please go con uh, go subscribe to their channel and watch their videos because as I've found they make some really great content so let's dive into this Fluminense have the right. weirdest football tactics in the world, probably, <laughs> because what their coach Fernando Geniz is doing goes against pretty much everything we see from modern European mm. teams. Rather than a clear structure in possession, players arrange themselves in vague, unpredictable patterns, and rather than attacking space, they play in congested clusters at the side of the pitch, wait, wait a minute. progressing Whoa. the ball. That doesn't feel like that would work at all. I. You, I don't know if you guys saw. Let me back up just a little bit uh, so you can see that picture there. So you got like this, this whole open field, and you see what one, two, three, four, five, six players here on the line. I don't, I don't feel like that's even more than that. One, two, three, four, five, six. Why are they leaving so much space on that side of the field? I don't like it. I don't like it at all. Um, I don't feel like this is this is gonna work. It makes me uncomfortable <laughs> thinking about it. I don't I don't like leaving that much space on the pitch, man. Um, in in any sport, like especially I'm thinking about an American football, you leave that much that that much space open in the field. Guess what you're gonna get hit with? A deep pass to the end zone to score. So I'm kind of like wondering if this is the weirdest tactic because it's not working. Uh, and if this is working, how the heck is it working? This, these are just some thoughts that I'm getting first off, so I'm, I, I guess we're going to figure it out. Let's see. Attacking space, they play in congested clusters at the side of the pitch, progressing the ball with these intricate passing moves. But the weirdest thing about this philosophy is that it seems to work. Fluminense came third in the Brazilian league last year, which very few people expected. They also just won the Campeonato Carioca, which is an annual tournament wow. in Rio, and have started this year's league campaign in very strong form. That's all started a very interesting conversation in Brazil, a country that continues to be in a sort of footballing civil war <laughs> over the Europeanness ah. of its national team, both in its squad selection and very much in its tactics, which many have claimed has robbed the Seleção mm. of its identity. So Genesis yeah. Fluminense, a complete rejection of European tactics, have become quite significant, and some have even suggested that Genis could be a future Brazil wow. national team coach. So today, I want to give you guys a glimpse of this distinctive philosophy and whether it could impact not just the Brazilian game, but football tactics all over the world. So let's do it. I appreciate the, uh, I don't know, the way the way that he's stepping away from the, the Europeanness of the game. Like, he's trying to do something different. Um, and so I can definitely respect that. Um, and I can I can see, too, like... The more I'm learning about like the World Cup and the way these things work, people are so attached to their countries, right? And uh, they want their they want the people that they are, the people that that represent them, to represent them out uh, with their team out in the World Cup as well. So um, I can definitely see how some some things will go back and forth here. So I really respect uh, Fernando here for for doing the unthinkable or doing something that other people really aren't doing, obviously, and implementing something new to the game, or at least new to this league, outside of what is being done in the EPL, um, and and really making it work, too. He's winning with it. Um, and so I'm, I'm ready to learn this, this breakdown, though. It's of positional play, or in Spanish, juego de posición. And by now, it's probably the most common tactical approach at the highest level. 
used mm. by coaches like Pep Guardiola, Mikel Arteta, Eric Ten Hag, Thomas Tuchel, Xavi Hernandez, Antonio Conte, Roberto De Zerbi, and many more. And it's called positional play because it's very concerned with the positioning of its players, turning right. individual movements into ones that serve the team as a whole. That's, That's right. why typically in these systems, the coach will design a very clear structure and the players, when it comes to deciding where they position themselves on the pitch, do so within the context of that structure. So even if there appears to be a lot of movement, they're really just rotations that maintain the predefined shape. To take that a step further, those shapes often form the basis of repeatable passing moves or automations so that players have a practice set of instructions depending on the circumstances. The Zerbies Brighton in their build-up phase are a very clear example of this. That's why some have likened the modern European game to chess, where the coaches are the grand masters, moving their pieces around the board, good... and the players are kind of the pawns fulfilling specific roles. That that's a good actually comparison to of of what it's really like, because watching some of these games is so tactical and so strategic uh, that it feels like you're watching chess, right? Two masterminds at work. Um, playing against each other in some of these games, and so that's a that's a really fair comparison. And so I I wonder then if this idea of whatever Fernando's doing is is actually breaking that mold and making it less like chess and making it more like something else. Um, it's it's interesting to 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 see. Of course, that's a bit of a cynical way of looking at it. What those coaches are really trying to do is reduce the decision-making right. burden on their players, allowing them to focus more on technique so that they can produce more consistent performances regardless of the opponent. That's just an overview of positional play, but the basic principles of zone occupation and automations are the foundations of a lot of top level football teams at the moment. So over at Fluminense, Janice looked at all of this and said, no thank you, I'm gonna do something wow. completely different. Now what's interesting is Janice is still a coach that wants to dominate possession. He wants to play out from the back. He wants to control games using the ball. So the objectives are very similar to those positional play coaches but the means are completely different. And the first and most telling difference is the lack of clear structure. In possession, there is no predefined shape that the players must conform to. Wow. Now, that doesn't mean there is no order whatsoever. There are centre backs primarily concerned with defending, a centre forward whose sure. job is to attack the box, and midfielders that link the two. So roles certainly still exist. But the distinction is that these roles aren't confined to wow. specific zones. These players have near total freedom of movement wow. for the sake of creating relationships with the players around them. Because for Fluminense, creating relationships between players is more important than creating and exploiting space. That's kind of the headline of this video, so I'll say it again. Creating relationships between players is more important than creating wow. and exploiting space. For a positional play team, space is kind of the be all and end all. The reason they're arranged so specifically is because they're trying to manipulate space to keep possession and to attack. In my very last video, I talked about Xavi's Barcelona and their obsession with space in terms of their structure, their style and decision making. But Genesis Fluminense basically don't care There's about creating here. space. Instead, what they care about is forming relationships between players which is how you end up with so many players in such close proximity. Here you're seeing Aria come all the way across to the other side of the pitch to create numerical overloads and more possible combinations. It's almost like they're trying to turn the 11-a-side pitch into a 7-a-side one. And even if they do get the chance to move the ball out into space, Fluminense very often don't, instead recycling it back wow. into the congested area. That that That's wild right there. Because nine times out of ten, if you're watching this, like... Uh, you know, I'm pay attention really closely to Newcastle this season, and and I'm I'm now their their supporter and and a fan of Newcastle, and that's my team, and I'm sticking with them. It's our year. <clears throat> yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, uh, so as I'm watching them, almost ten times out of ten, that pass is going out there to the the right of the pitch, and it, it's going out to the open space for him to kick that back into congestion. Really makes me wonder. I think I said this in my uh, gag impressing video. It really makes me wonder if the ideas that some people have for moving the ball up the pitch, right? Like if they're getting pressed and all they want to do is kick it way up the way up the pitch because they feel like that's the only thing they have. 
if sometimes kicking it to the teammate that's closest to you, even though there's congestion and stuff like that, if that's not the better choice to make versus trying to make a, a, a pass that's probably going to lead an error anyway, um, this this is about to probably break that mold for me in my mind. And 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 gosh, that it's so it's so weird to see because I the football that I've been watching up to this point doesn't look like this, um, but obviously it's working for them. Right, obviously it's working for them, and it works right here. He kicked it back into congestion, as you can see in this freeze frame here that I pull up. You can see that he's making that separation right, and he's getting up the pitch uh, with ease right by the defender. So, both of these things would be considered absolute sacrilege for someone like Xavi yeah. or Pep Guardiola, but it's all good getting players in close proximity. What happens next? Do the players just <laughs> freestyle? Well, no, there's a misconception that in the absence of structure, players are just kind of doing whatever they want or playing on instinct, yeah, no, and that work. isn't the case. They're still using basic principles to organize themselves, and those principles have been coached. So to explain a couple of them to you, I'd like to draw on the work of Jamie Hamilton and his fantastic article called Whoa. What is Relationism? If you're not familiar with Jamie's work, I highly recommend you check him out. He's one of the central writers in English when it Definitely comes to that football out. philosophy, and I'm going to be referencing his work here. So the first principle that I'd like to explain is a universal one, which can be simply described in English as a give and go. In his article, Hamilton divides it into two parts, the pass and run, known in Spanish as toco y me voy, and then the reciprocated pass completing the move and put together you have a tabella or in english the one two and as basic as this seems this is the kind of relationship between players that i'm talking about now obviously every team in the world uses a give and go but for fluminense it's part of the core footballing language that allows players to interact in the absence mm. of a permanent shape hopefully that becomes more clear in this second example which is the escogenia portuguese for staircase and it's essentially three players staggered in a diagonal line, which allows for ball progression through this line, often by the central player flicking the ball up the staircase or using a dummy known as a ah. portalus. And this can often lead to a tabela. Honestly, you could spend all day trying to dissect the many principles that these players are using. But the point is, the core point is that rather than seeing the game in terms of global structures, Fluminense players instead see these local emerging relationships. That Man, I wonder how weird it is for guys that are playing here um, in, in Fluminense and they, if they came from a different background, right? If they were, if they were raised to play the game a different way and then they step into this, this program that seems like it is kind of like freestyle, as he said earlier. I wonder if it's if it makes them uncomfortable and if they can even step into that system easily, or if it, if it takes a lot of time to learn this. Uh, because I'm thinking, like, yeah, that that's the first thing I thought whenever they whenever he brought that up to begin with is that they have no structure. That means that they're doing whatever they want out there on the pitch. But functionally, that doesn't make sense, right? Like you can't do that and get away with it because uh, it's never going to work. You put 11 of the most talented men on the planet out there and they don't have any structure and every man just wants to do whatever he wants to do. It's going to be the worst team you've ever seen play. doesn't matter who's out there on the pitch. Um, but in, in this sense, you can see, well, if they're winning and they're doing these things correctly and they're actually able to move the ball and stuff like that, well, obviously they're doing something different than – uh, than just freestyling it, right? So there is that relationism uh, to the game, and I and I like understanding that and getting to know that and seeing that there's there's something to passing this ball around the way that they're doing it. And I even like that, like false man, like using that that decoy there uh, to get the ball moved up the pitch because all it's doing is is drawing defenders uh, to that person who they think is going to receive the ball and that and actually doesn't it's actually brilliant um, to see that. So even in in a method that seems like it has no structure. It's very clear that it does. It just doesn't look like what I'm used to seeing right now and probably what a lot of us are used to seeing. It's a completely different brand of football with arguably more variety and invention as improvisation is more necessary and passing lanes appear where you wouldn't expect them to. Of course, positional play teams have principles of their own. They will use tabellas. We often talk about the third man principle, but the big difference here is like we said earlier, these actions are embedded into the structure itself, which is usually made up of many triangles for this purpose. For a team like Fluminense, who play virtually without structure, their relationships are constantly appearing and disappearing, mm. making them more spontaneous and unpredictable. So even in moments of apparent chaos, order somehow emerges. 
which can make for, in my opinion, some very entertaining football. Of course, in a practical sense, this approach is not without problems. The sheer density of players means that it can get very congested, yeah. your opponent can become extremely compact, and progressing sometimes becomes too intricate. Although on the flip side, that does make for a reasonably effective counter-pressing system, using the touchline yep. to cage opponents in transition, which yep. I think is the main reason they combine on the side. Yeah, of the because even if you turn the ball over there, if you have a good system of press, so like your offensive movement may not be very structured, but if you have implemented in these in these men hey if you turn the ball over let's turn it into a press well yeah the congestion actually helps in their favor because just like the the team that just stole the ball from them they're gonna have a hard time moving it as well if uh they're able to flip it around and, and, and press well if they do turn the ball over so that makes sense pitch rather than the middle and overall this approach has been much more effective than anyone thought it would be and fluminense dominate the vast majority of their games and have scored some really nice goals along the way as you'd expect though, this environment is suited to a very different type of footballer to the one playing at the top level in Europe. There's a lot of players I would love to highlight here. 21 year old Andre I think could be an absolute superstar, he's kind of the defensive pivot. The centre forward Herman Cano is a genuine goal scoring machine, but the player that best encapsulates this philosophy is their talisman Ganso. You may remember Ganso as a teammate of Neymar in the Santos team that won the Whoa. 2011 Copa Libertadores. But while Neymar moved over to Europe, Ganso played the vast majority of his career in Brazil, Santos, Sao Paulo, and Fluminense. Ganso is an exceptionally gifted footballer, an old school number 10 with immense technical ability and spatial awareness that allows him to make rapid decisions with and without the ball and execute them with quality. And in this team, he is the heart and soul of their combination game. He's given 100% positional freedom and he goes wherever he wants to create the tabellas, the Escaginius, and to keep possession or to turn possession into threat. Quite simply, without a player like this, you can't play this way. And that's interesting because despite his immense quality, if you try to fit Ganso into a modern attacking structure in Europe, a 3-2-5 for example, you would really struggle. There's no set position or even mm. fixed role that really suits a player like this. He needs the positional freedom to play his game, which was partly Man. why when he did- All right, so him pointing that out, I wonder too sometimes if there aren't players that are sitting on the bench right now in the Premier League who could be better in different leagues, you know, maybe play in a lower league or something like that or even in just a different league, like maybe La Liga or Bundesliga, somewhere where, you know, a, a manager may be implementing some tactics that aren't necessarily so binding to a certain position and to a certain style of play, like they're able to have a little bit more freedom. Because like he said in this, this guy wouldn't fit into any real system and any real position tied to, like he needs the ability to be able to breathe and to be able to make decisions and to be able to make plays uh, on his own with structure, but it allows him to have some freedom in the way that he does it. It's not so much, you know, hey, as soon as you get the ball, you absolutely have to do this one thing. It's like, no, nah, he can he can kind of do what he needs to do in the way that he sees the game playing out because he it's built into the system for him. And so I wonder if the way that, that Fernando is actually succeeding in this is because he's finding guys who – can do this and who need that to actually function well as a player and he's he's instilled in them and said i'm going to trust you with the ball i'm going to trust you with the game i'm gonna let you play to, to 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 your strengths and stuff like that just as long as you listen to these few minor things that i'm telling you you're able to play the way that you want to and it's actually going to work out for you in the end that's so cool to me to see that though so cool to me to see that that gonzo is able to do this the way that he's able to do it um, because he has the freedom to be able to play i love it did eventually make it to Europe at Sevilla, he didn't flourish at all. In fact, he only played 28 games under Jorge wow. Sampaoli, who was using a lot of positional play ideas. In that context, Ganso was seen as too individualistic, too much of a luxury player. For the same reason, he was consistently snubbed by Brazil coach Dunga, one of the key wow. players in the Eurofication of the Brazil national team. It's ironic that a player like Ganso, one incredibly selfless whose greatest talent is to improve those around him, could be considered individualistic. Kind of reminds me of someone else. 
Anyway, in most European systems nowadays, the players that succeed are those who can take on instructions and follow mm -hmm. the patterns created by the coach. Right. This Fluminense model, however, suits those who play more instinctively, who have a talent for interpreting drastically different situations. I'm not at all suggesting that one is better than the other. It's more about yeah. different people thriving in different environments. That's a good distinction. And that's the bit I find really fascinating about this whole subject. And it goes back to the identity crisis in Brazilian football. No, that's a that's a really good distinction, and I'm glad that he said that because it doesn't mean that this system's better than than another one. If this system was better than another one, then everybody in the English Premier League would be implementing this system, right? Um, however, I think that there probably is some more teams who could implement this and probably be a lot better off than this highly structured thing that they're trying to do with players who might not be able to function under that structure, right? Uh, it allows different players to play. Uh, in different systems and allows them to flourish, whereas they probably wouldn't be able to, in other ways, players that are more instinctive, players that uh, don't necessarily listen to the whole structure thing, but maybe grew up playing it a different way. You know, maybe they weren't in the uh, academies and stuff like that. Maybe they come up, they came up in a little different bit of a lifestyle and then got into the academies later in life, but they grew up with that street ball kind of kind of sense of like, I'm playing off an of instinct, not so much off a of structure. And so I wonder if more teams couldn't benefit from this kind of play. Sure, following the European model makes sense because it's been successful, but you're applying it in a very different context, with players who have been raised in South America and not in Europe, with vastly different language, culture, and ways of seeing the world. There's one more great article I'd like to recommend before we finish. Uh, it's by Joseph Bosick, and it essentially compares Pep Guardiola's coaching style to a form of European government, where <laughs> liberty is assumed, but only within the confines of the oh, law. Meanwhile, and I quote, in Latin America, when it comes to order, we might have a great formal list of what should and should not be done, but in the end, everything is negotiated. negotiated. And that yeah. creates a different relationship with authority and surely a That's different right. dynamic, even when it comes to organizing a football team. And when we start to look at football as an extension of culture, I think the conversation about tactics takes on an entirely different dimension. Man. And in an increasingly global world, Janice's rejection of the status quo is honestly refreshing. And personally, I hope it inspires others to think of football in different terms and along different cultural lines because I think we'd end up with a richer and more human beautiful game. Yeah. Man, I agree with that 100%. It definitely has has made me look at this differently already just off this one video. I'm I'm highly interested in the Brazilian way of play now and honestly getting into more and more countries in the way that they do things. Um I'm man. Okay. It's so cool to me uh because this is such a worldwide sport. You know, when I when I think about, like, American football, I think about how confined I am to just a few countries. Like, if I want to watch really good gridiron football played, I watch it in America. If I want to see some fun things happen, sometimes I'll turn on the Canadian League. Every once in a while you can watch some, some football in Germany that I found out about a couple of weeks ago. Um, but it's just not the same, right? If I want to watch really good football played – I watch it in the Amer in, in the NFL, right, or in college football. However, for global football, right, uh, I, I forget what a, what association football, right. Um, it's a lot different because it's such a worldwide sport, and it is just an extension of the culture around these teams and like how they implement it and how they play and things like that. So the more that I learn about a team and the more that I learn about a league and the way that I learn about players, the more that I do those things, I feel like it's the more than I'm learning about the culture and the countries and the people groups that are behind these teams and behind these players. And I feel like I'm really expanding my view of the world and my understanding of this beautiful game, man. This has been so incredible. Thank you guys so much for your support, for your kindness, for your care, everything that you guys uh, give to me in, in every one of these videos. You you guys, even whenever y'all are correcting me on stuff, most of the time <laughs> y'all are really, really good about still being compassionate with me as somebody who is still new to the game. Thank you so much for that. Um, look, I hope that that you're enjoying these, this journey through the, the beautiful game as much as I am. If you are, please subscribe to the channel, like and comment on the video. Let me know what you think. Let me know what you, what I should cover next. I, I feel like I'm just scratching the surface of the worldwide sport that is football. And so if you have somewhere, uh, a team or, or a country or something you want to point me in the direction of, 
please do because I would love to see it. Um, that's it for me today, uh, and I guess I'll see you guys in the next video. Boy, they're gonna think that's beer. This is not beer. Uh, you guys probably don't even know what a beta is. It's a local brewery here in New Orleans. Why am I even telling you? This is not going in a video. This is a local brewery here in New Orleans, anyway. Uh, and uh, it's called a beta, and they make really good cream soda and root beer. So I'm drinking a vanilla cream soda. You might be able to see that. Yeah, there you go. So not beer. Um, anyway, that's not going in a video, so it doesn't matter. <laughs>